grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to continue our series now in the life lessons from the life of Jesus Christ. And today we're going to explore the lessons that we learn and draw from Christ's lives regarding suffering. Clearly we live in a world in which suffering is a reality. It's not my intention here, of course, in this particular message to answer the age-old question of why there is suffering in the world. In other words, why is there pain? And why is it that uh, so many of our uh, brothers and sisters whom we love and, and who believe strongly on Jesus do have some suffering and pain in their life? Uh, there are uh, in, uh, some inadequate uh, explanations that have been given by certain people for why there's pain in the world. For instance, Richard Dawkins in his book, The God Delusion, basically concludes that suffering and death is ultimately meaningless. It's just simply part of the natural selection process that we're all part of in this evolutionary world. And so, obviously, suffering and death, survival of the fittest sort of thing, these are kind of things that are going to happen. The weak will die off and the strong will survive and we'll just keep getting better and better. And so, uh, there's really no meaning to suffering in that sense. Well, obviously, that's a rather inadequate uh, uh, explanation, especially for those who really caught themselves and find themselves in the real suffering that goes on in the world. Other answers are less adequate. Harold uh, Kushner uh, wrote a book some years ago that was fairly popular called When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And his ultimate conclusion there was uh, that God is not powerful enough and not really uh, uh, intelligent enough to really stop pain and suffering. Uh, that uh, God's uh, creation uh, uh, is, is not really perfect. And therefore, since it's not perfect, uh, and, and we're dealing with a God that's not completely perfect, uh, then uh, there's something terribly wrong here and God really doesn't have the power to solve it. And that's basically the conclusion he comes up with and is basically our meaning is drawn from suffering by how we help one another. And finally, there are some answers that we can kind of latch onto that give meaning uh, to suffering in the world. And uh, one of those was given by James Dobson, of course, in his uh, little video uh, uh, I mean, his little audio book called uh, Knowing God's Will. Uh, and also there are under, uh, 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 a very small, little, wonderful little book by Peter Kreeft, which is Making Sense of Suffering. Uh, and, and these are wonderful ways of looking at it in, in a way as being part and parcel, not only of the fallen world in which we live, we inherited, uh, none of us caused it essentially ourselves, but we inherited it, and how we are to work out the will of God in our lives in the midst of this. Isn't it, isn't it much better to know that God has a purpose for our life? And we can say, Romans 8, 20, 28, all things indeed do work together for good who, to those who love God and are called according to His purpose, even though we're called in the midst of a world that is not perfect. It's not perfect. We're not going to go this morning into the deep, deep mysteries of suffering. Rather, I want to be looking at the life of suffering. The life of suffering that Jesus endured and our life lessons of suffering to the ultimate victorious life that God gave Jesus Christ in and through that. Did Jesus Christ not get victory in the end? We would all confess, yes, we have a festival called Easter in which we celebrate that victory. Were His days of suffering over? Yes, His days of suffering were over. Were the marks of His suffering still in His body? Yes, the apostles saw the nail prints. Thomas put his hand in the piercing in Jesus' side. So he carried those. Were they affecting his life at that point? No. Why was he carrying them? To remind us. That just as he gained victory, God has provided a victory for those who live in this broken world. Who have inherited, perhaps, in this world, the ways of human suffering. And that there is meaning in it. And there is victory in it. There is victory we have a man right here in our congregation for whom we have prayed and we have prayed diligently who had a life-threatening disease. We brought that man up to this uh, altar. Our elders laid hands on this man and prayed for him. 
that the Lord would work healing in the midst of his suffering. That man is sitting in this congregation right now. He just got a report from his doctor that his cancer is in complete remission. No sign of his cancer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. Yes. You know, God makes a way where there seems to be no way. I would like to look. You have your outlines there. I'm going to look and examine uh, four areas in which Jesus' life of suffering instructs our life of suffering. And these three areas are, these four areas are misunderstanding, hatred, betrayal, and physical pain. So all of us are going to have some kind of suffering in these areas in our lives. If we're going to live a long life or a life in this world, somewhere along the way, we'll probably experience one or all of these four areas of our life where there is some suffering and there is some pain. Let's take a look at Jesus' life. The idea of misunderstanding, being misunderstood. In other words, as you live out your Christian life, as you authentically live as Christ would call you to live in the world, as you exercise your spiritual gift that I spoke to the children about, as you exercise those gifts in the world, are people going to misunderstand that, perhaps? Well, first of all, there's going to be misunderstanding in your family. Your family may misunderstand what you're doing. For instance... I, uh, uh, in Mark chapter 3, verse 21, Jesus said this. It is said this of, of Jesus. When his family heard what was happening, now what was Jesus doing? He was out there preaching, healing, out there uh, uh, doing his ministry among the people uh, of uh, Judah and uh, Galilee. And they said, when they heard what was happening, his family, they tried to take him home. They wanted to take custody of him. And this is what their comment was. He's out of his mind. He's out of his mind. They had, they had completely misunder, misunderstood what he, what he was doing in his life. A mother came to me one time and said, Pastor, you've got to talk to my son. And I said, why? Well, you know, he, uh, he's going to graduate from high school and he wants to go to this Bible school out in North Carolina and become a missionary and, and, and preach overseas. And I'm, I'm looking strange and I said, Aunt, uh, yeah? Well, that's just too dangerous. I, I just can't have him doing that. No, no, no. You have to talk to him, Pastor, and get him to stop doing that. You know? Your family sometimes just doesn't understand when you want to live authentically for Jesus Christ. You want to live like Christ. Make the decisions Christ made. Sometimes the family just doesn't understand. And there's a kind of suffering in that. Sometimes your friends don't understand. In Matthew chapter 7, 17, we read, Jesus replied, You stubborn, faithless people, how long must I be with you until you believe? How long must I put up with you? And he was talking to his disciples. I mean, he was talking to friends. And then again in John 14, 9, he says, Philip, don't you even know who I am? Even after all this time that I've been with you? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking to see Him? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say are not my own, but they are my Father's who lives in me and does His work through me. So sometimes when somebody is living authentically for the Lord and really stepping out there in faith and doing what appears to us may be dangerous or, or seems to be not very sensible, we have to trust that God is working in that person's life. If, in fact, the fruits of that life are saved people. Are saved people. So his friends sometimes just didn't even... And even his apostles, and who he called friends at the Last Supper, still don't quite understand it. And then, of course, the leaders of the people certainly didn't understand it. In Mark chapter 3, verse 22, and the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebul, which is basically the prince of demons. It is by the prince of demons that he casts out demons. They totally misunderstood what he was doing. Jesus said to them, If demons are being cast out, then know this, the kingdom of God is among you. The kingdom of God has come. Why are you misunderstanding that what God is doing here is transforming the world? He's throwing out the prince of this world that God again may have sway and His Word be in His people. And they totally misunderstood it. 
Misunderstanding is sometimes, as we live out our authentic Christian life in this world, is sometimes something we have to suffer <coughs> from people who just don't get it. I know a lot of young people who go to colleges these days, it is very difficult for them to stand up for Jesus, so to speak, in some contexts, in liberal universities and in public, uh, public schools. It's tough. It's not easy to stand up for Christ and to be an authentic Christian living out your life differently than those around you and really professing Christ in that point because there's a lot of misunderstanding. Secondly, there's actually hatred. Uh, it, it goes without saying that there is actual hatred of Christians and hatred of Christianity and the Word of God in our world today. Clearly that exists. And we're going to have hatred from the world. Jesus experienced that, John 7. The world cannot hate you, but it does hate me because I have accused it of sin and evil. So what is the source that we learn from Jesus of the world's hatred of us? Well, the source of it is that we stand against their evil. We stand against their sin. And we say that we do. And we uh, are, are willing to bring people to task and, and, and conviction of their sin and lawlessness. And that's what the preaching of the law does. That's why we preach law and gospel. It's the preaching of the law that convicts people of their lawlessness so they will turn to Christ. Why would we not preach that in all contexts of the world so that people would turn to their Savior Christ and be saved? But the world will hate us for that. He goes into deeper uh, in John. He goes deeper into explanation in chapter, uh, uh, chapter 15 of John. When the world hates you, remember it hated me before you. The world, uh, if the world would love you, if you belong to it, but you don't. See, if you conform yourself to the world and look like the world, the world will love you. But if you conform yourself to Christ, then you stand as an accusation against the world. I've had young people say to me, it's very hard to have friends in college and live an authentic Christian life. Well, I said, well, I guess you need to find some Christian friends <laughs> in college. Or make some Christian friends in college. And then you'll have friends who will share what you share. But the world is not just going to jump in and share with you, right? Since they persecuted me, naturally, they are going to persecute you. And if they have not listened to me, they're not going to listen to you. So there comes a time when you have to, even if you have a friend, so you have to simply say, well, I'll pray for you. But you can't associate with that friend anymore. Because they are so contrary in their lifestyle and the way they live to your walk in Christ. If they have listened to me, if they have uh, listened to me, then they will listen to you. And if they don't, they won't. The people of this world will hate you because you belong to me. And we see this over and over again, especially in countries where uh, the gospel is closed, such as North Korea uh, and other other parts of the world. Uh, people who um, are uh, preaching Christ in those contexts are hated almost to the point of death. Uh, and Jesus gave the parable, of course, of the ten talents uh, in Luke chapter 19, and he says, but his people hated him. There was a king, and uh, he had given some talents. And it says uh, in uh, um, the parable in Luke 19, but the people hated him uh, and sent a delegation and said, we don't want this man king over us. And then he says, if I, in John 15, if I hadn't done such miraculous signs among them that no one else could do, they would not be counted guilty. Jesus is saying that he has actually done God's work in front of them. When you stand up and authentically witness Christ in front of someone, you're doing exactly what God has sent us to do. You're, you're, you're prophesying. What did Moses uh, say to Joshua? in our Old Testament text today, would that all the people of God would prophesy. That is testify to what God is doing. Would that all the people of the church would confess the name of Jesus out so that everyone would come to believe. But as it is, they saw all that I did and they hated both of us, me and the Father. This has fulfilled what Scripture said. They hated me without cause. Without cause. Then there's betrayal. There's the suffering which comes from betrayal. We see this in Jesus' life. Now, Jesus was betrayed even by close friends. We can be betrayed by friends and companions. It happened in Jesus' life, Matthew 17. One day after they had returned to Galilee, Jesus told them the Son of Man is going up and He will be betrayed 
and will be killed. He will betray, be betrayed and will be killed. I remember having a very good friend who was an Orthodox a rabbi who was a believer in Jesus and become a believer in Jesus. And he told me this story. He said he had grown up in New York in a very strict, strict uh, Jewish home and he was the son of a very strict conservative rabbi who all dressed in black, the hat, the whole thing. And he said, uh, and he went to a rabbinical school and became a rabbi himself. But he realized that so many of the Jewish people were non-religious. They were not keeping the law. But they didn't even know the scriptures. And so it was his desire to reach more and more of his own people with, with the scriptures. And so he started a conservative synagogue, but not a strict one. He took off the garb. He cut his hair. He, he began to interact with, with Jewish people like, like a, a rabbi would, not a strict one. His father disowned him. His father completely disowned him. He was, uh, his whole family was not to have anything to do with him. And then when he became a Christian, his father had a funeral for him and declared him dead and would not even allow his name to be mentioned in his house. To be mentioned in his house when he became a, a believer in Jesus. What we call a Messianic Jewish man. The point is, Friends, acquaintances, family can betray us. When we get to Jerusalem, he said to them in Matthew 20, the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests, to the teachers of the righteous law, and they will sentence him to death. And then in, verse, in Matthew 26, and one of you who is eating a table with me will betray me. Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Teacher, am I the one? Is it me? And Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. His closest companion, one of, the, one of the twelve, himself would betray him. Later, Peter would. At least, uh, Peter repented of it. And then, of course, your close confidants. These are the people that are closest to you. Clearly, Peter was among Jesus' confidants. Whenever Jesus, Jesus had the, the, the disciples, then he had the twelve, which was his inner circle. Then he had his inner inner circle, which was who? Peter, James, and John, the brothers of Zebedee. That was his inner circle. One of them was Peter. And this is what it says of Peter in Luke 22. And Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. The rooster will not crow tomorrow morning until you have denied me three times that you even knew me. And so it happened. It's reported in John 18. And one of the household servants of the high priest, the brother of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, didn't I see you in the olive grove with Jesus? And Peter denied it again, and immediately the rooster crowed. This is one of the biggest obstacles for young people, is to testify to Jesus when they're being put to the test. It's tough. It's tough to stand up for Jesus when you're being put to the test this way. Really, do you really belong to Jesus? Is Jesus really who you are? There's an African woman in Sudan who is now in prison. And uh, in the part of Sudan where she lives, it's under Sharia law. And she has been put into prison because she has been accused of apostasy. And under Sharia law, apostasy is uh, punished by death. <coughs> she was pregnant when she went into prison, so she had a child since she's been in prison. She had an 18-month-old, and that child's in prison with her too. So her two children and she are in prison, okay, accused by her husband of apostasy because obviously she wants to raise her children as Christians, not as Muslims. And so she's been accused and convicted. It is under the sentence of death for having converted, even though when she married, she was a Christian. She had been raised as a Christian her entire life. But having been accused by a man of apostasy, she is now in prison with a death sentence on her. Betrayal. Some people suffer deeply because of their Christian walk. And then, of course, there's physical pain. We see that Jesus lived a life without shelter. He says in Luke 9, you know, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Uh, physical pain of choosing God's will over others is clearly in our world today. Uh, it says in Hebrews 2.18, 
Since he himself has gone through suffering and temptation, he is able to help even those who are tempted, those who are being tested. It goes on in Hebrews 5, so even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience through the things he suffered. And then in Hebrews 9, but our high priest offered himself to God as one sacrifice for sins. Jesus suffered even unto death that our sins be taken away. That in fact, no matter what suffering the war brings upon us, we are going to be able to suffer that for the sake of Christ. Persecution is going to come, and we want to willingly embrace it. First Peter is, a, is one of the letters, the two letters that Peter wrote after he realized that he was going to go to his death for Jesus. And so he's writing these encouraging words to the church. And this is what he says in 1 Peter 2. This suffering is all part of what God has called you to. Christ who suffered for you is your example following his steps. And then later uh, in, in that chapter he says... He did not retaliate when he was insulted, meaning Jesus. He didn't retaliate when he... Look at Jesus on the cross. He did not retaliate. He said, Father, forgive them. He gave his mother over to John to take care of. When he suffered, he did not threaten to get even. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. We turn our life over to God in every circumstance of our suffering in this world. And then in Hebrews 12, we read, Let us run the race with endurance, the one that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising its shame, and took His place seated at the right hand of the throne of God. At this point, I would invite our evangelist to come forward at this time to give his testimony of his walk in the Lord and the work he is doing to bring literally to tens of thousands of people the message of Jesus Christ and the hope of salvation. Uh, Shake Joseph, please. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, I want to thank Pastor Muda for, uh, for the opportunity he gave me to share my testimony for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, in fact, I was very much blessed when I was first introduced to Pastor Muda. Um, because of him and through him, I'm able to raise support in Oak Road Lutheran Church. Uh, he's a great uh, strength uh, for me. He's uh, standing behind my ministry for so many years. Because of his uh, support, I'm able to serve God effectively in India. Um, I would like to share my testimony. I was born and brought up in a Muslim family in India. Because I was born and brought up in a Muslim family, I used to go to mosque and offer prayer to Allah five times in a day regularly. I used to believe that there is no God but Allah, Muhammad is his prophet. I never, never believed Jesus Christ either to be son of God or more than God. I always believed Jesus that he is one of the prophets like Muhammad, Isaiah, Jeremiah, etc. As I was living like a strong Muslim, going to mosque five times in a day, believing that Jesus is one of the prophets, there is no God but Allah, Muhammad is prophet. One day, one of the evangelists came my home and he wanted to offer me a New Testament of Gideon's International. I did not want to receive that Bible from him, but he forced me a lot to receive that Bible from him. Because he forced me a lot, I received the Bible from him. The reason why I did not want to receive the Bible from him was the Bible says Jesus is the Son of God, uh, which, is, which is an abominable for the Muslims to hear. Therefore, when he wanted to offer the Bible, I did not want to receive it. But since he forced me a lot, I received the Bible. Even though I received the Bible, I did not want to read it because the Bible says Jesus is the Son of God. Because I did not, even though I received it, I did not want to read it. I just thrown the Bible into the trunk box that was in my home. But exactly after two years of receiving that New Testament from the Gideon International Evangelist, I saw a clear vision of Jesus Christ. 
in my vision i saw heaven open jesus christ and his angels ascending and descending in heaven clearly i saw the vision of jesus christ in my vision i saw jesus christ and his angels ascending and descending in heaven i woke up in the early morning i was very much upset for the vision i had then i went to the pastors evangelist whom i knew very well and i asked with them about the vision i had but unfortunately everybody said we do not know anything about your vision so i came my home i was always thinking about this vision what is this i saw jesus and his angels ascending and descending in heaven what is this i was always thinking about this vision day and night seven days passed by there is no answer for my vision after seven days of this vision one day i came my home from outside in a noon time to have lunch in india we eat with hands instead of uh, going to the washroom without my knowledge i went to the trunk trunk box that was in my home without my knowledge i opened the trunk box then i opened the trunk box the new testament that was given to me two years ago by an evangelist by force it was there so without my knowledge i picked up the new testament into both my hands looking here and there i just opened the bible when i opened the bible uh, this is the verse i saw from gospel according to john chapter 1 verse 51 gospel according to john chapter 1 verse 51 i am reading it for you and he said to him most assuredly i say to you hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of god ascending and descending upon the son of man dear friends even though i was given bible i never read the bible before but when i opened the bible this is the verse my eyes saw this this verse exactly fits to my vision i saw jesus christ and the angels ascending and descending in heaven and uh, this is the verse i saw when i opened the bible when i when my eyes went through this particular verse i realized that jesus christ is not only a prophet but jesus christ is a son of god or god himself and he is the creator of the whole universe then i stopped going to mass and began to go to church to learn more about jesus christ i went to church for 6 months then i realized that i must repent for my sins i repented for my sins and i accepted the lord jesus christ as my per- as my personal savior then what happened for all these six months my parents thought i had some christian friends in the church for the sake of fun i was going to church that's what they thought but when they came to know that i accepted christ as my personal savior through baptism they called me and asked me to stop going to church i said to them i can't stop going to church they said why i saw the vision of the lord jesus christ they said to me satan would give you a lot of visions to, to sight track you don't believe in those visions they said i said had satan given me vision he would not have given me scriptural support for my vision because jesus christ gave me a vision he gave me scriptural support i said and uh, here i want to say one thing to you that you know in india still muslims would have visions christians would have visions and hindus would have visions buddhists would have visions satan gives them visions too but when satan gives visions he would not give scriptural support but i am sure when the lord jesus christ gives you vision he would always give you scriptural support the vision or dream based on the word of god is called true vision see had i been given only a vision and had i not been given scriptural support i would have denied this this is this is not the uh, this is not the holy scriptures i would have denied but you know jesus christ gave me vision and he gave me scriptural support so that i cannot deny the scriptures therefore see that when you have vision you have the scriptural support so when my parents asked me to quit going to church i said i had the vision based on the word of god and finally they asked me if i am stopping to go to church i said i cannot they beat me up to the point of death and my parents disowned me from home 
Then they disowned me from home. I slept in uh, train stations, bus stations. I had no shelter. I had no food for several days. I used to drink the water that would come in the public taps in India. Uh, one day when I was sleeping in the train station, the Muslims who lived in the same village where I lived, they came to me and said, fellow, you better run away from the village. Otherwise, we will kill you. They said, I brought bad reputation to Islam. So I was moving from place to place to keep myself from the anger of Muslims. As I, when I was moving from place to place to keep myself from the anger of Muslims, the pastor who baptized me, kind enough toward me, and he came to me and said, don't go here and there, come and stay at my home. So fortunately, I, I found shelter with the pastor who baptized me, and I was staying with him. When I was staying with him, I was keenly observing his financial condition. Uh, he has uh, 11 kids, five sons and six daughters. And uh, you know, on Sunday, people are bringing only vegetables, raw rice, living chicken, eggs, and they are hardly offering coins in the offering box. Nobody gives tithes in India. So when I saw my pastor's financial situation, I decided within my heart never to be either an evangelist or a pastor. But I was thinking and planning, God called me for the full-time ministry. I said, God, I can't serve you. I can be a witnessing to you. See, my pastor is going through a lot of financial problems. People never give tithes. They only are giving, uh, offering only living chicken, eggs, and uh, vegetables, raw rice, that's it. So, when I, when I thought of not being a pastor on this, God called me, I said I can, but he did not listen to me. He hit me from top to bottom. I lost all my health. Then one day I realized of my sickness, I obeyed to God's call, I went to a Bible college in, in India. I studied the Word of God, a course called Master of Divinity. I finished up my studies and I want to serve God as a pastor. But in India it is very tough to serve God as a pastor. Unless you are married, you cannot be respected, honored or entertained in their homes to preach or to, to teach them the Bible. So my friend suggested to get married before serving God as a pastor. So I wanted to get married. But in India we don't have dating system like we have. We have all arranged marriage system. We have, our parents would select a girl or a boy for our marriage. So what happened? I don't have a parent. My parent disowned me. I took the pastor who baptized me. I went to the Muslims. I thought of marrying a Muslim girl so that I can bring her to Jesus Christ. So when I, to, when I went to Muslims, they said to me, you donkey dog, get out from here. How dare enough you are to coming to us and asking us to, to give our daughter to you. You became one of the lower caste ones. Get out from here, they said. In India, we have casteism. High caste, middle caste, lower caste. Christians are always counted to be lower caste ones. In some areas, they are counted to be untouchable ones. So, Muslims said, I became one of the lower caste ones. They don't want to give their daughter to marriage. Then I turned to Christians. You know what Christians said in India? Oh man, we don't trust you man. You were a Muslim in the beginning. What happens if you again go back to your Islam? If you have to your religion, what happened to our daughter? We don't want to give our daughter to you. See, neither Muslims trusted me nor Christians trusted me in marriage. I, I looked for 20 matches. Everybody denied me. No, no, no. Somehow the 20 first uh, proposal, uh, God bless me, uh, the pastor who baptized me became mediator between me and my wife's parents. Somehow he made them to agree to give their daughter to me in marriage. I was married. I have uh, four daughters now. Um, as Pastor Moda said, I am preaching in particular uh, the gospel to the Muslims in India. Um, at the same time, I am also preaching gospel to Hindus also. Uh, I was very much blessed uh, to have Pastor Moda in my home, uh, I think in 2008 or 10, I don't remember. He came and he preached in my churches. I was very much blessed. So, India has more than one billion population. Uh, still, people are worshipping monkey god, 
elephant god, uh, even still some areas people are worshipping cobra also. Still they are saluting sun and moon. So, in order to reach these one billion people, it is not, I felt it is not sufficient to uh, preach the gospel in the church itself. Therefore, I decided to preach the gospel through the gospel crusades. Uh, I gathered 10,000 people, 8,000 people, uh, 7,000 people in the gospel crusade and uh, I, I make the people to preach uh, among 10,000 people. Uh, I have a friend here in Lawrenceville, Georgia. His name is uh, Dr. Jerry Rush. He is coming to me and I am conducting gospel crusade uh, with him and uh, he is preaching the gospel among 8,000, 10,000 people because we have 1 billion people. You know, my lifetime would be not enough to preach the 1 billion people. Therefore, I am reaching the unreached with the gospel crusades. So, so please pray for my ministry. And um, still, uh, my brothers and sisters are uh, Muslims. My parents, they became old and they died. I still have my brother and my sister. They are all strong Muslims. Still, they believe that Jesus Christ is one of the prophets. Then I tried to preach them. They said, you are a... Uh, what? You are a madman. Be quiet, they say. So, they are all strong Muslims, my brothers and sisters. Please pray for the salvation of my brothers and sisters. And please pray for my uh, ministry. I am also planting churches in India where there is no churches. I have six churches now, six pastors with me. Um, I am planting the churches where there is no church in India. So, I come every two years here uh, so that I can raise support for my pastors. I can raise support for the gospel crusade. I, and I can raise support for myself and my family. Because still in India, people are bringing only vegetables, raw rice, living chicken, eggs. They are still offering only kinds in the offering box. Nobody is giving tithes. Because India is one of the developing countries. Oh, therefore, please pray for my ministry so that I can be effective for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, I want to thank Pastor Buddha for uh, standing behind my ministry. Thank you all. God bless you all. God bless America. Okay. God bless you. We thank you for that, uh, my dear brothers and sisters. We thank you, Joseph, for that testimony. Uh, the, the working of God in uh, especially closed countries and countries where there is a lot of opposition. We know our brothers and sisters who are cutting edge, spear points of the ministry uh, in those areas do suffer quite a bit. And so we will continue in prayerful support as well. Uh, as, as you do, I'll have opportunity as God leads you after, after the service as well to give uh, some support to our dear brother here as well. Um, you know, sin is the loss of the image of God, uh, and it has resulted in suffering. It's resulted in suffering and pain in various ways and forms in our world. And sometimes, due to our own sinfulness, we have uh, experienced this. And, and when we have converted and come to Christ, uh, sometimes uh, the uh, tension on us is, is intensified. As our brother testified uh, when he was encouraged to become a pastor and he saw what kind of suffering that would mean for him, uh, he said, no, no, I'm not going to do it. And then he says, what did he say? He said, the Lord beat him from head to toe. <laughs> Which really means he made him sick. He made him sick. He said, well, I will do the, will, the Lord of the Lord's will. I have a very good friend, Joseph Song, who is doing a ministry in Atlanta now, a very strong ministry in Atlanta, had the same, same experience. In Korea, the Lord was saying, oh, you need to become a pastor and evangelist. And, oh, no, 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 no. and uh, he got sick. And he was literally near death in the hospital. And, uh, and then he said, Lord, you've got my attention. <laughs> and now, of course, he's doing marvelous evangelistic work right here in our own city. So, uh, the Lord does work in these ways to bring us through this pain and suffering in order to, to work these marvelous works that God would have done in the world. So let us finish with Hebrews 4. But we have a high priest who has gone into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us cling to Him and never stop trusting Him. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same temptations we do, yet he did not sin. So let's come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive His mercy and we will find grace to help us in the time of need. Amen. May that peace of God therefore that passes our human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.